thank you for coming to this session. So I think it's the third one we, um, we have today as Veritas. Hey, better. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to see you here. You have any questions? Better is here. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, I'm, I'm lucky now here. I have better. I have Rakesh, um, senior manager for engineering. So yeah, any question you have, um, he's here. Uh, so just a thing. So Rakesh is flying from Pune, from India. Uh, he's flying from Oslo. Well, you was somewhere else yesterday. Dublin. I'm coming from Madrid in Spain. So you know, coming from different places, right? To really talk. We're very excited about uh, hyperscale for open stack and what we're building. And I think it, it was a great day, at least for me. So I'm super happy, right? And all the things I've been listening when we was in the panel today and talking about what you need, yeah, data protection, backup, and, and quality of services. I was like, I know it's a salesperson, but I was like, stand up and say, hey, here, here we are. That's, <laughs> that's perfect, yeah. But that's the reason I build products and I don't, do not sell, right? Um, so, but it's, it's interesting. So the way we did is we had the keynote. We had another session talking about the quality of service. Now we're going to be talk about data protection, okay? And that's aligned with the architecture and with the value prop that, that we have. So just a quick, quick reminder of what we saw this morning. Remember hyperscale for open stack. So we define a storage based on hardware of your choice. I got that question this morning and uh, during lunch is that it is, it is not hardware I'm going to sell you. You buy the hardware that you want. This is really software. Okay, so you build it uh, as you want. Compute plane, what do we have in the compute plane? It's the storage quality of service. Okay, where we have our, our algorithms that Rakesh gave a lot of detail in the other session of what we're doing there, how we implement quality of service, our read cache, write cache, and so on. That's where we have our instances running with the full copy in your compute plane, getting the storage capabilities of the compute plane. That is the I.O. that you need now that your application is running, okay, which is also protected because we got this resiliency with reflection, which is the deltas. So every write you make is, uh, is resilient according to your policies that you define in your flavors. Okay, and so we keep that full copy plus the deltas. And then what we have is this data plane. That really is a perfect thing also into the economics of the solution. Because what that means is that your second copy, your third copy, according to your flavors, are gonna be to the data plane. The data plane is cheaper and deeper storage. Okay, and what we get there is that every 50 minutes we get those deltas, copy the deltas down and generate a new point in time copy. Okay, but it's not only that, it's that that point in time copy allows me to do data management or data protection and allows me to do it from the data plane. What that means is that if you think in the IO path and how is that happening, the application is, can you use this, it's right in here. Right? My backup is reading from here. So you don't have noisy neighbors. The backup itself can be a noisy neighbor, right? Because sometimes you have to go here, read, and then here you have one instance fighting with another one, and then it's a mess. All the reads are coming from here. Okay? So that's one of the key elements, and we're going to be talking about that more in detail. So this allows you zero backup window, backup as a service, uh, integration with net backup, and also, we got the REST API, so you have any other solution, you can use APIs and get all the benefits from the data plane itself. Uh, so I talk about this a little bit. Yeah. You, you also said in, uh, in the presentation uh, this morning that you had an application. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about that. Okay. Um, Rakesh is going to provide a lot of details, and you're going to see a demo of how it works. Okay. Um, so a little bit of what we do, because as I said, hyperscale is very unique. It's not just another SIMDA driver, okay? It's, it's really co-engineering with OpenStack and the different components where we have to have some touch points. And if you take a look to all the plugins that we have created and the check-ins into the open source, you will see that, right? So with the Juju Charms, we have six that you can just go and, and, and install and with all the dependencies and so on. The same thing coming with triple O for uh, the next version. So we have the volume extension that is running on the data plane. Uh, we have a volume extension on the Nova that allows all the filtering and the decision and intelligence about where to place, where I'm going to be my deltas. All that is taken for you. 
we have the integration with Horizon, as you saw this morning, all the visibility of what's happening with the storage into Horizon. We have uh, the collectors, uh, Stillometer, and so on. So really, integrated solution, very unique. It's not just a storage solution that we try to attach to Hyperscale. It's something that we built from the grown up with Hyperscale, and now also with containers and, and Docker and Kubernetes, because we have the same solution for them, okay? But built for the grown up with this kind of, of solutions, okay? So the data management at the data plane, we get this 50 minutes point in time copies that it's happening by default. So it's not something you have to enable, that's happening. Because also, and we're not talking today about that, it's all the resiliency, right? So it's another key component is that uh, because the deltas and the writes you have to compute, and because the point in time copy, if anything crash, you have all your writes. And this is happening automatically. I'm going to generate a new volume for you from the first second, you're going to start reading from that volume. But this is done real time, or can you lose 15 minutes of data? You're never going to do any data. The 15 minutes, according to your deltas, every delta is going to be reflected in a synchronous way. And what that means is that one server crash, my delta is already on another server. So I have my deltas plus my last point in time copy. It is like live migration. We do live migration. So we enable live migration with direct attached storage. It's on the same way. I have my writes going, I do my reflection, I move my workload, and I get my deltas plus my point in time copy. And it's one of the benefits is, is being locality. Right? If you compare with things like Ceph, when at the end you add another storage, and then you have to rebalance everything, here you have computes. You add another compute, that compute is coming with a local storage. You start running workloads there. Nothing happening in the rest of the storage. But your recovery point objective is zero. Yes, yeah, yes. zero. Okay. But also that's according to your policies. You can, have a pol you can create a, an instance with reflection factor zero, because I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Or another one with three, because I want to survive two failures of the compute. But yeah, the, how you present it, it looks like recovery point objective. Okay. But then you, you, then uh, you get the, the deltas in the compute now. Yeah, you have to go back yeah. to the original architecture yeah. with the reflection and the, uh, and the, so the compute plane mm -hmm. and the data plane and think of them as working together. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that this is a holistic solution, yeah, we introduced the data plane to store those point in time synthetic copies for the full, mm -hmm. but one, one reflection target and your latest uh, point in time copy on the on the data plane will always be equal to yep. to your full copy. Mm -hmm. The other key thing is, in the case of a storage resource failure in your compute plane, you keep on running the instance wherever it is. It just keeps running. It's just using the storage now somewhere else. Right? Good. You are hijacking my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Uh, so that means zero impact backup for OpenStack because all the reads are coming from the data plane. We do nothing with the compute plane. Well, we do just copy the deltas. So a backup is coming and you get, uh, give me the last seven minutes deltas. Generate a new point in time copy and then run a backup from that one. And as I said, this integrates with Veritas uh, 360 data management. One of the key things is the integration with net backup we're gonna see today. So what is the role of the data plane? Okay, again, this is a full integrated thing, but let's take a look to what the data plane is doing. So the mission for the data plane is get what we call the EDS, which is episodic data sync, that's generating the point in time copies from the deltas. It is also used for re rotation. So this may happen when something crashes, a compute crash, you have to re rotate data somewhere else, but you just have to move the data, not to give a massage to your whole storage. Okay, so just the data, or you're doing a live migration. Okay, we use that too. And then we have two companies here. One is something we call external storage provider. That can be anything. It can be a virtual machine, can be something, whatever you want. So you go to the UI, enable, and then we push all the binaries, all the stuff that we need. And then when you take a snapshot, you can take a snapshot and move that snapshot to the external storage provider. And you move data run. One of the external storage providers can be net backup, okay? And we want to see that. So the episodic state of things happening every 15 minutes, 
you take a copy, you get that bit for all, you go to the UI, you're going to see all those snapshots. You're going to see the snapshots you can take anytime you want. So anytime you can make an API, right click, whatever, take a snapshot, or this happening by default that you can use at any time. Just make a click on there and decide what you want to do with that snapshot. Okay? So how it really works, you have the admin piece, you install a net backup, we just need a, what we call net backup media server, it's going to move the data. Uh, when click registration from hyperscale to net backup master server, so they know each other, and then assign the policies. You create policies in the net backup, the policy really tells you how often you want to run the backup, what is the retention policy, and things like that. Okay? And then you assign that and say, okay, when this policy is coming, I want to back up my Cassandra flavor or my gold flavor or uh, any instance with the name productions or anything which is active. You, you make your rules, okay? Create those rules. And then from that point in time, the user is just automatically protected. And from the user point of view, the user can go and select, see my backups, make one click and do the restore. So let's take a look to, to how it works. I will go you, I will guide you through the, uh, through the demo. You will see quickly how it works. So this is the UI. You go to the uh, backup export. You say this is a net backup. You put the name of the net backup media server or the IP. You put your password. So you are, this is one one-time operation. It's when you have to register with net backup. You do the registration, this is pushing all the binaries that it need, are needed to that media server. Okay? So now they can talk each other. You got that registration with the media server. And now what you do is go to Net Backup Console. If you are not familiar with that, it's a very, uh, I guess, easy one where you create your policies. You define a new policy. Uh, you, here you define when you want to run the policy, what is the retention, uh, how much how long time you want to keep your data, uh, and so on. So you create a policy. Again, you can create as many as you want. You may have different kind of workloads running. You create all of them. When it's created, you go back to hyperscale. You're going to see every policy there. And what you do is to define the policy actions. When, that, when NetBackup execute that policy, what are you going to do? OK, so here I have an a, a instance called a backup instance, I'm going to use as one example with the filter for the name. I go to the backup policies, I'm going to say a same update. Here you create the query. The query can be name equal whatever, flavor equal this, uh, status active, inactive. You run the query, say yeah, right now I got this, this one. I assign the policy and I close it. So now it's registered. Every time this backup is coming with that schedule, at that policy name, the data node is going to run the query and it's going to decide what needs to be protected. So I run a full backup now. I have the visibility in these funny things, uh, the net backup uh, activity monitor. You see the green one who, which is running, right? I go to my task in the horizon. I can see the backups. It's been created, it's been, uh, it's been running there. So I have the visibility from horizon itself of my backup activity. And if I go my backups, I have my list there. I can make a click and restore. This list is coming for net backup. So when you click there, we query the net backup master server. So say, what backups do you have for me? We get the list. You make a click, give the name of the instance or the new instance you want to create. Click on restore. This is going to talk to the net backup. It's going to identify the data for you. Move it back to the data plane. Okay, and bring it up again. Again, what's going to happen? You copy that to the data plane, then reiterate to the compute plane and trigger the instance. So you can see the restore is complete, is done, and if you go to Horizon, you also will be able to see that your instance is there up and running. So now it's creating, reiterated, it's complete, and the instance will be but restore backup instance. So just one click operations to restore. Okay. So let's go with forecasting into the details of how this really works and then we're going to 
test the um, application consistent. So the, 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 the backup contains the deltas from the compute plane and the... And the uh, yes and no. Oh. So yes, because when you take a backup, you generate a snapshot. So at that point in time, you get the last deltas mm -hmm. and generate the point in time copy. Yeah, okay. And that is what we backup. Mm -hmm. So yes, contain the deltas, but it's not two different pieces. Every time you take a snapshot, we go to the compute plane and we ask, give me the last deltas since the last whatever minutes. Okay. And then generate a new point in time copy, and that's what you move. And it's not only the data, it's the, also the metadata. OK? So it's not just the, the data, it's all the things around the instance. Mm -hmm. So everything you need to bring that instance back again. OK? So that's an, also an important uh, thing. So how the magic works? Thank you, Carlos. May I have and you need the uh, microphone. By the way, everything you said is not recorded because you didn't have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wasn't important anyway. Nah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, kind of in detail answer the same question there. So, okay, how do we make sure that okay, whatever we have, we backed up, it's the consistent, application consistent, plus the complete, right? So everything starts either from Horizon or from the API. So as Carlos mentioned, that we do have APIs which you can write your own client use those HTTPS based REST APIs to take the backup. So the first thing which happens is the create snapshot. Now when, whenever we are taking a snapshot of a volume in OpenStack environment, the command goes to Cinder. Cinder is the storage driver. Since hyperscale and what, what Cinder does is, Cinder creates the snapshot of that volume, makes the database entry so that it can associate the snapshot with the volume. So whenever the next query comes, it knows that okay, this snapshot is created for which volume. Since Hyperscale also has its own Cinder driver, when you install Hyperscale in OpenStack, we give you a volume type which is Hyperscale volume, right? So we have a Cinder driver. And whenever a snapshot request is coming to Cinder, we get that notification in our Cinder driver. Now we know that, okay, this is our volume and which VM is using this volume. We also know that, okay, this VM is hosted on this particular compute. So you can have multiple computes in your environment. We know that the compute. Now, just to answer, this command we send it to the compute node. And that is where hyperscale component sitting and interacting with the NOAA node going to talk to the chemo guest agent, which is installed inside the virtual machine. And that chemo guest agent is going to talk to the application, make sure that we have the consistent snapshot taken, application consistent snapshot taken for that particular data or for the particular virtual machine. We are going to see a demo later on in this slide. Once we know that okay, an epoch is marked and a snapshot is marked for the data, we take that data to the data plane using our EDS method, episodic data sync, which we have uh, seen in point in time. So point in time copy is automatic, which happens after every 15 minutes. EDS will also get triggered even uh, when, whenever customer has invoked the snapshot command. So with that, all the data from that application, from that point, which is application consistent, comes to the data, data node. So that's, that's what I mentioned. That was yeah, the yeah. question. At that point in time, we get all that down to the data plane. But that's not zero impact backup then, because you, you freeze your application. Well, no, that is just a momentary. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, going to talk, I'm going to talk in detail about it, but freeze the application. The application is not frozen till the time the snapshot is taken, till the time data is moved to the data node, or till the time it is backed up. It is just for a moment to mark the epoch or we just insert a marker. So we, uh, whenever an application is doing IO, it is doing IO in a sequence, right? So let's say I've got an application request that, okay, this is something where which I need to take the snapshot of. I just make an IO, that IO says that okay, this is the snapshot IO. And we allow application to fly, uh, kind of continue to do IO after that. When the snapshot is given, we create the version by reading that snapshot marker. The other thing we have to do is to put an epoch. You don't have to wait for all the snapshots to be taken uh, or copied down. Yes, put an epoch So on the deltas. Mm -hmm. So we know what deltas are before and after. Okay. That's all. It is the just thing another is, IO. We will do this in the next release across all the VMs you have in a consistency group. Because it's just that, put an epoch. Mm -hmm. Consider it just another IO of application on that particular volume. Right? So once. Uh, once we get the data on the data plane, we create a version for that particular volume and we update the Cinder DB so that next time whenever restore is invoked for that volume, we restore from this newly created version. Now I'll go a little... Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, 
ask you one question? Yeah, sure. You said, uh, you said that the VM location is also stored in the database. What happens if the VM is being v-motioned? How yeah, yeah. So, up, how does it get updated in the database then? Okay, so this database is not the hyperscale database. There is the MongoDB database which OpenStack uses. Now the OpenStack has the information, so you can run OpenStack Nova list, right? So which which tells you that okay, these are the virtual machines, and this virtual machine is hosted currently on this node. So now, it's the database of OpenStack. Yes, of it's okay. so. Th that's where Carlos mentioned that, okay, it's not a product which is built and later integrated with OpenStack. We have built it for OpenStack. All that information which is there in OpenStack, we understand. And we make OpenStack understand what we are doing. Yes, I right? So Good. another example, so one more example I would like to state, uh, which we discussed earlier, is that, okay, let's say if your VM is running on Compute 1, right, and something happens in the storage of that data node, if that dies. So your VM continues to run over there, but we will service IO from the some other node. In that case also, we will let uh, OpenStack know that, okay, where is the disk, where is the data? Yeah. Okay, going uh, one level in deeper into it. So this is EPA first architecture, microservices, everything is built on EPA. So we have built all the backup APIs. You talk about from discover perspective, you talk about from snapshot or backup or restore perspective. For everything, we have hyperscale APIs available. Now, to make this hyperscale API available, these hyperscale APIs to service the request talks to three components. The component which we have on the hyperscale NOVA, uh, hyperscale compute plane, which is actually your NOVA node where the virtual machines are running. We have our services running on the data plane and we have a hyperscale controller. On the NOVA, NOVA node, what we have is we have actual NOVA and KVM services running and for every virtual machine, we do have a libword driver which talks to the KVM and then which understands that, okay, this is the application which is writing and which is not writing. On, on the data plane, we have Cinder driver plus there are two deep hyperscale daemons which we have. Hyperscale control daemon which addresses or services the control command like snapshot, restore, create the versions and all those things. Backup daemon is the daemon which talks to the backup application. So let's say uh, I am writing a third party application and I want to make some calls that, okay, take a snapshot, give me the data, and I have the data, restore this. So actual data transfer is governed by the backup daemon, and the control daemon takes care of the control commands like snapshot and version management. We have our data node storage layer, which keeps the history of version management. So uh, we discussed about creating point-in-time copies after every 15 minutes. Now consider a case that your OpenStack environment is running, let's say, for a two years' time. So are we going to have this, those many copies? No. So this DNSL is kind of going to keep latest two copies, and this is all this is policy driven. You can define how many copies you want to have, right? So this is, and we interact with directly storage. Hypers is there a maximum number of copies you can store? You can define as many as you want. Okay, so there's no maximum. There's no maximum. So the architecture is quite flexible, and apart from those two automated snapshots, whatever snapshot user have taken, all those snapshots will keep, will never uh, re, uh, kind of garbage collect those things. Hyperscale controller is a component which orchestrates all this flow in terms of when to talk to Nova, when to talk to Cinder, when to initiate the EDS and taking data from compute to. Hyperscale API just talks to these components. It talks to OpenStack Nova service, talks to Cinder driver, talks to controller, and the demons to service the request. So this is a nutshell in terms of how, how do we service it. Okay, now I'll jump into the application consistent demo. Okay, before this, I'd like to give you one background. I'll just pause the video for a second. So in this environment, what we have is, we have a Windows instance, Windows virtual machine, which is running in OpenStack environment, and that virtual machine has Microsoft SQL Server running, right? So we'll see how it is. So for any virtual machine, which you want to have as an application consistent backup or application consistent snapshot, you need to talk to the chemo agent. So first thing what we have to do is like, we have to modify the image to have chemo driver property. And that chemo driver property needs to be set as yes. So means the KVM running knows that, okay, this particular virtual machine has a chemo guest agent installed. In this case, this is our virtual machine, which is launched with that image. Now we are going to install a chemo guest agent inside it. Once the chemo guest agent is installed, hyperscale plus NOVA and the guest machine all are connected. As soon as, now in this case we are seeing that, okay, this is a Windows machine, so Windows Service Manager is showing. 
we are using HammerDB here to generate the SQL I/O workload. So HammerDB is just an application which can uh, simulate the TPCC SQL workload. What we are going to do is like we are going to create a job, just provide SQL Server credentials into it so that it can talk to the SQL Server. We'll define that that okay, we have 20 dat databases which we are operating on, and 20 users simultaneously working on those databases. What we are going to do is we are going to run this script for 30 minutes. Once the job is created in HammerDB, we'll just going to, we are just going to run the HammerDB. And you will see that okay, all the users, there are 20 users which we have created, are using the, those 20 databases randomly. And during this time, we go to the net backup because it is a net backup, you can invoke the API. We just initiate the backup. Once the backup is initiated, you will see that guest, which is the Windows machine, and the Microsoft SQL Server application, it knows that okay, backup is running. And it identifies that okay, backup request has come. So I, I don't know, how many of you know about VSS writers? So yeah, so SQL VSS writer, it talks to this, it tells the SQL VSS writer to freeze the application for a moment. We take the snapshot copy and then uh, we insert that marker. And that is how the snapshot is taken. Once the backup is complete, you will see that okay in activity monitor of the net backup that okay backup is taken it is complete you will also see the task completed in hyperscale pen once the backup is there you can consistently restore it so we have just created this backup what we are going to do is we are going to restore it we will go into the backup this is our backup which we have created using one click restore we are going to spawn up another vm with this data okay? now remember we have taken a snapshot of a vm which was running microsoft sql server with 20 users simultaneously putting load on it. When we have restored, your SQL management studio is able to recognize the database without any problem. So this is the application consistent backup. Yeah. With this, we can. Uh, so so there is. Before you dive on, yeah. how many of you used Cumio guest agent? Not many. You one? Two. Okay, so fair enough. Do you think it's a, is it an overhead? Do you use Cumio guest agent? I'm not so uh, impressed with it, that's why. Okay. okay. Yeah. But maybe now? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in, in, in the morning, we had uh, three people in the panel, right? So we have we had Voxbook. Three minutes, so let's go through this and make sure we can get questions. Yeah, yeah. so we, we can take the question. This is just a slide in terms of how our uh, backup APIs are exposed. So, uh, we, what, what we have is like OpenStack environment is a secure environment. When we talk to this OpenStack environment using a backup application, you do not want that backup application to be sitting in the same. It will be sitting outside in some public network so that if the whole site goes down, your data is still protected. So this channel, talking from backup host to the hyperscale data node is secured with HTTPS protocol. All the APIs are HTTPS REST APIs. So you talk about backup APIs or you talk about data transfer APIs. They goes via HTTPS channel. While the back hyperscale data node, the information it needs from the OpenStack, they talk over HTTP REST based API. So if you are sitting inside the OpenStack environment, you can either use HTTP, HTTP APIs. If you are sitting outside the environment, you use the secure HTTPS API so that your data is also protected when it is transferring over the channel. Yeah, this is pretty much which I had. So what's, what question do you have and of course what do you think? How about if your data is encrypted? Is there also something about encryption with that or not? So we can encrypt data with... Uh, so NetBacker will encrypt the data and it stores it uh, once it's read it from the data node. Uh, and obviously you just talked about the um, capability to protect it using HTTPS. Now, if you want to encrypt that communication path as well, that's network layer level encryption. Yeah, so this is what HTTPS will do. No, but that's our data transfer. Yes. yes. But the actual uh, backup host that... Correct, so that is the where the net backup software... Automatically encrypted. So, so net backup is, a, is a, you know, one of the large enterprise backup solutions in the marketplace. It has all of the backup functionality and features that you could potentially want. Oh, in order, like, if the backup host gets compromised, then they have your data. But that, that's it's encrypted. Yeah. It's encrypted. It's encrypted. What type of encryption is um, I don't know offhand. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, 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 there are multiple options for you. Uh, can, you can you find that again in the policy, when you create that policy? 
one of the properties is how do you want to encrypt the data. So you just make one click and select that. But it also, it's, it also depends on how the data is stored, right? So when you store it, you store it in a deduplicated pool, for instance, uh, each chunk of data will be encrypted individually with its own hash and its own uh, CFC uh, algorithm. As, but you can also store it on tape. Uh, maybe not a lot of people still use tape, but some people do. Yeah, right. And that could have an encryption key tied to it as well, tied to the, the hardware of the tape device. Mm -hmm. Data plan, what kind of storage is it? Whatever you want. It's commodity hardware. If it's network attached storage or not. It's com no, it's commodity x86 boxes uh, with local storage. Mm -hmm. You could potentially attach other storage to those x86 boxes. But by default, we, we'd recommend, you know, 3U box or 4U box with a little bit of flash and lots of spinning disks. And that's always going to be cheaper than an array from yeah, but by the way, if you have in your lab an array, a SAN environment which you are using, you can still use that storage with the yeah. data, data plane. Yeah. So we reuse the but existing storage you have. have the, uh, the 3U nodes or something like that in front of it, then you can use your backups. Yep. So no Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. a software only solution. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you.